with us at with from the Church Conservation Trust. So as you all have, um, for those of you who have been with us before, um, in these first 10 minutes, um, we, me and our Chief Executive, Peter Rez, we have a quick chat about a Pacific Church in our care, which has relevance to today's lecture. Um, but as I said, it's just for this first 10 minutes and we'll be um, kicking off the lecture itself at 1 p.m. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass you over to our Chief Executive, Peter Rez, who's gonna tell you more about the church we've cho uh, chosen to tell you a bit more about this week. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, George. Hello, everybody. And uh, yeah, it's our general warm up slot for Church of the Week. You'll be pleased to know uh, that this week's church is the Church of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Hemington. And I am just going to show you a picture of this fantastic church. Uh, here we go. You should be able to see that now. So the Church of Blessed Virgin Mary in, in Hemington has a long history. It was originally built by the Normans and it was enlarged from 1230 onwards over the next hundred years. The font inside the church, which I believe I have a picture of, I just have a little look down here. No, no, I haven't got a picture of the font. Um, sorry, I didn't mislead you there, but I thought I did. Um, the, the font inside the church dates from 1260 uh, and the normal chancel arch inside the church is particularly fine, which I do have a picture of. You can see this here. There are two shots of that fantastic uh, Romanesque arch there. Um, the church was heavily restored in 1859 by that pillar of Victorian architects, uh, George Gilbert Scott. Uh, we've actually got a few of Gilbert Scott's bits of work and actually the most famous one is perhaps uh, All Souls Halifax, which he described as his best work really. Unfortunately, he designed it with uh, interlaying, lock, uh, interlaying la layers of sandstone and limestone, which unfortunately react with each other, which he didn't know at the time. And so it causes an effect, which is much like snowing on the interior, but it's still an amazing building and well worth a look at. So back to Hemington. So uh, it's had its fair share of tragedy as well, because after having Gilbert Scott do some work, on the 21st of November, 1899, a local labourer discovered a fire above the organ. The, the fire was actually eventually extinguished, but there was some, some significant damage to what remained of the medieval roof. Uh, so most of that was lost. Uh, and it was started by, as always, a small stove being left. The church was, was closed for regular worship, uh, and then vested into our care at the end of 2019. So it's one of our most recent vestings. And since then, we've been carrying out a lot of urgent repairs and conservation works. And it ties into today's lecture, really, because Andrew Zeminski, who's going to be lecturing to you today, has been involved with these works and still on site with them. In fact, um, we've spent or we're spending uh, in excess of £365,000 uh, conserving this church so it's brought back up to scratch and then we'll carry on maintaining it through the rest of its life because we have to now look after this forever which we're very very happy to do so. Thank you so much Peter that was um, a really interesting insight into one of the churches in our care and for those of you who have joined us a warm welcome to our lecture today and um, if you join us for the first time do comment away let us know um, if you are joining us for the first time and where you are joining us from but um, everyone you're most welcome with us today. So Peter you've just mentioned there that, that we're spending £365,000 on just this one church um, is there an average cost or an average uh, amount we actually spend on a church that's vested into our care once upon a time george uh it cost us an average of about three hundred thousand pounds to take on a new vesting and we're definitely seeing that cost rise uh recently uh, a church we took on called gamston uh cost in excess of 1.3 million pounds and we've got some more in the pipeline where they're well over well one's well over a million pounds and the other one's in the region of six hundred thousand pounds so i think there are the, the the cost of new vesting seems to be rising quite considerably but, you know so we're 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 keeping an eye on that which means that we have a we have a ring fence new vesting budget which we use over a three-year period and obviously if the more the more churches we can do depends on the cost of, of putting them into full repair so they're they're easier to maintain into the future and where where does this money actually come from because it's a huge amount of money that's invested um, when a church is vested into us where does that kind of money come from to build up that um, budget so the, that, the, the ring fence budget for new vestings comes from very generously from the church commissioners uh, and they in turn get that money from the sale proceeds of 
other church buildings, ones that they sell off that aren't historic ones or listed uh, generally, or, or they have found other uses for. So part of that money comes into the church commissioners and they then in turn invest that in the CCT. And we have a, a three year rolling funding order usually. Uh, we're also supported by D the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, which we're very happy. Uh, that is a slightly different process. So at the moment, we've got a one year spending review uh, and hopefully we'll get another multi year spending review as well. But I will say that we do get that money, which is the bedrock of what we do. But we, we more than double that money every single year through our own fundraising, our own commercial activity, which is absolutely essential to make sure that we can provide this infrastructure of support for communities to care for these buildings right across the country. And we can do some quite dramatic things with some with a very few uh, of our churches. We're just about to finish on site in Worcester and Sunderland, we hope, and they're big multi-million pound uh, repurposing projects. Thanks, Pete. And I suppose one of the things that, um, you know, working for the Trust that's been really interesting, is it's not just the case, is it, that when a church is vetting to us, we just do that initial investment and we leave that church alone, then we don't do annual maintenance. We constantly do annual um, conservation work at our churches, don't we? Absolutely. Well, the, the yes, uh, daily care is very important. So taking the SPAB principles of looking after a building every day, it's absolutely essential that you take good care of buildings. And we we do uh, maintenance visits twice a year. We do six monthly checks as well with our with our staff uh, and we make sure that the buildings are in good repair. And we also plan what repairs are needed into the long term. So we have a good rolling program of identifying works. The, the point is, uh, these buildings don't stop needing our attention. And the reason for that is a gravity. So I think that the best investment we could ever make is in an anti-gravity device for churches, which would probably help uh, make sure that they don't fall down uh, and don't need repair. But rather than investing all the work and uh, all our money in that research, we find that regular maintenance is, is the best way and good planning just to make sure that we're on top of those things. Because inevitably roofs will will deteriorate uh, masonry will uh, mortar will come out and there'll be damage to windows etc so it's just a case of keeping on top of it and good planning thanks peter and how important are traditional craft skills and traditional materials um, as part of our conservation ethos at the church in you know caring for historic churches well, they're absolutely fundamental. The, the historic building itself is a system. I'm sure that Andrew will ex, uh, expand on this in his lecture, but uh, he, he is a practitioner and an expert, but historic buildings are a system and they use traditional materials and these traditional materials help the be building breathe. Uh, it's, it's really important. So the use of stone, the use of lime mortar in particular is, is very untraditional material, the clay tiles or the lead roof. Or the, and the carpentry, they all work as a system together to enable the building to deal with the issues of war, those structural issues. So uh, the traditional um, materials are absolutely fundamental, but also uh, the skills to apply those traditional materials is really important. And we've been doing a lot of work looking at the, the numbers of, of craftspeople in the country, and we're quite concerned about how many companies there are to undertake the specialist work. And so we're trying to find a mechanism to how we can support more people uh, going into the, the industry with the right sort of skills uh, to make sure that there's a constant supply well into the future because they're very specialist people. And also I hope Andrew will reveal to you today, they have a particular mindset as well. Conservation is not about get it done quick. It's about thinking through very carefully how the building works and making sure all those elements pull together. So the, the traditional skills and the traditional materials are fundamental to conservation of these particular buildings. Thanks, Peter. We've got one minute to go, so I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Um, how important is it and how do we involve local communities um, in the vesting process? Well, it's really important. The vesting process itself, I'm sure that's a subject for uh, another another day. You you suggested a lecture, but I think you, people might be a bit bored by that. But the, the whole point is that these buildings get given to the CCT uh, once they've closed for regular worship. And we try, as soon as that happens, as soon as we know it's coming to us, we will get on site as quickly as we can to try and find that local community around that building to engage them with the work that we want to do and say, rather than the building is closed, this building is going to be open. Uh, that's a fundamental of all CCT churches. We want to get the doors open so that people can come in, they can use and love these buildings. So we work very hard to identify who in the 
who in the community is is interested and then support them to hold events to to get the doors open and make sure the building is used and loved they're, they're, they're pointless without people these buildings they really are it needs people to love them and uh, that's why i'm hoping this audience today uh, they all seem to love historic church buildings so i'll be grateful for any donations you make towards the work that we're going to do Thank you so much, Peter. So everyone, it's now one o'clock. So again, for those of you who weren't there um, at the start of our stream 10 minutes ago, um, welcome to today's lecture. It's really great to be welcoming you all. And if you're joining us for the first time, or even if you're just returning to us today, do let us know where you're joining us from. Um, as I said, though, it's a very, very um, lovely to welcome you all. So today we're joined by Andrew Zaminski, who's going to be talking to us about his work um, in heritage craft skills, and particularly um, his experience at work working um, and conserving historic churches, which are in our care. But before I pass you on to Peter Riez again, who's going to tell you a bit more about today's lecture, um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm just going to give you a quick tech overview for how these lectures work. So we're using Zoom, but we're live streaming onto Facebook. So do use that those comments. Um, there's that comment feature on the right hand side of your screen, or if you're using a mobile phone, just tap your screen and you'll be able to comment away. So do comment away if you've got any questions, and um, please do submit them because that's one of the best things about these lectures. At the end of them, um, we'll, there'll be plenty of time for you to ask our guest lecturer your questions. Now, these lectures are always 100% free of charge for you to watch and enjoy. We make the recordings also available free of charge, and those recordings are available on our playlist on Facebook or on our YouTube channel, and I'll post some links to those later on. Um, so if you see anyone commenting away telling you to watch the lecture here, please don't click them, um, they're spam links. Um, if you've got any problems sort of accessing these lectures, um, drop us a line and um, so send us a direct message or send us an email and we'll be on hand to help you. Now, the easiest way for you to come directly into our lectures whenever they start is to make sure that you both like and follow, it's really important you do both, like and follow our main CCT Facebook page. And what that will do is it will um, cause Facebook, whenever we go live, um, Facebook will automatically send you a notification that we've gone live and you just tap that notification and it brings you straight into this stream. So it's a really easy, and it's a free um, tool that you can use. Now I've created a video for how you can set that up. Um, if you can't find it, we'll put a link in here, but if you can't find it, again, just send us a direct message and I'm really happy to send you the link. Now, as I said, these lectures are always free of charge. Um, and if you um, enjoy them, um, please do consider supporting our work. We look after 356 historic churches at the moment. That number is likely to rise. Um, so, but as I said, you know, um, do consider supporting our work. Like these lectures, share them with your friends and family, invite more people to come. We'd really like to welcome more. But please do consider making a donation. So you can donate um, in a couple of ways. So you can do it on our website, which is 100% secure. Um, you can do that at visitchurches org.uk. Um, you can also send us a donation via text. So if you text um, the word CCT to 70331, that will give us a gift of three pounds. Now, finally, um, in response to um, the popularity of these lectures, we've got a really special membership offer. So if you join us by direct debit from just three pound fifty a month, we will send you not one, not two, but three um, wonderful, wonderful guidebooks from churches in our care. And those guidebooks are from Cambridge All Saints. Now this is a wonderful arts and crafts church. For those of you who joined us um, for Alec Hamilton's arts and crafts lecture in the 10 minute countdown, we spoke about Cambridge All Saints in that. So there's a guidebook specifically about that church. We've also got St. John on the Wall, Bristol. Now this is the last surviving church in Bristol, which is built onto the medieval um, wall. And it's got a gate, gatehouse right by it. And that's the gate that Queen Elizabeth I walked into the city of Bristol in. And the final book, which I haven't got, I'm afraid, is about York Holy Trinity, which is another historic church in the city center of York, which has um, some really interesting connections um, with um, Gentleman Jack. So if you saw the BBC series, not only was it filmed there, it's the real place where, um, oh, I've just forgotten my names now, um, where um, all that history took place. And um, there's some really interesting stuff in that church scene, including some fabulous, fabulous medieval stained glass. So as I said, if you join us by direct debit um, from just £3.50 a month, um, you'll get those guidebooks for free of charge. And um, we've got details of how to take us up on that offer, because you just need to use a lecture code offer. And that offer code is lecture, all in capitals, but we'll post a link. Anyway, I think that is enough for me today. But as I said, comment away with any questions you've got throughout this lecture. And um, if you've got any problems, do let us know. But over to you, Peter. 
Thanks, George, and good to see so many of you here again. Uh, I've just noticed that Adam from uh, the Diocese of Gloucester has joined us. I met him for the first time last week in a virtual conference in Germany. Isn't that bizarre? Uh, but it was about the reuse of churches, which is, is great to see. And see, see people from all over the world here. I think we've got people from yeah, all over the place. I'm not going to list them all because you know who you are, uh, which is great to see you. But we've got a real treat for you today. And just chatting to Andrew prior to this, he said, I've been watching the Church's Conservation Trust for 25 years, which I thought was uh, kind of, was that a bit sinister? But no, it was a good thing. Uh, he's been seeing how we've been evolving over time, uh, which is good. And, and the thing about stonemasonry, I think, is, is about taking time and care and seeing what's happened. So I think that's a good way of watching the CCT. So Andrew worked for the past 30 years as a stonemason conservator as a part of uh, as a partner of Minerva Stone Conservation, from repairs to megalithic burial chambers and the reconstruction of a Roman temple facade to an Anglo-Saxon shrine and Salisbury's medieval cathedral. Uh, Andrew's craft skills and knowledge have been put to extremely good use. Uh, he has published a book which is called The Stonemason and was published by John Murray's in March 2020. And maybe if you're lucky, he'll reveal what he really wanted to call it. So Andrew is an SPAB William Morris Craft Fellow, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London and a consultant to Salisbury Dawson Advisory Committee for the conservation of stonework and monuments. And I can guarantee, because he includes four CCT churches in his talk, this is going to be a really interesting story about the practical application of conservation. Andrew, thank you very much for doing this and over to you. Hi, Peter. Uh, thank you very much for that warm introduction and, uh, and for inviting me along. I'm very disturbed that you want to know about my mindset. No one's ever uh, want to delve those deep pits. Um, but my talk today is uh, entitled uh, A Life in Ruins. And um, is that up and running? I can't see. Um, it's not yet, Andrew. So if, again, if you just go into um, into your back end, um, have PowerPoint open already and then go in and do your share screen, that should bring it up. OK. Got it. Brilliant. Right, there we go. A life in ruins. That's not a personal uh, comment on my life but more on my business activities really um, but before we get cracking it would be good to just understand a little bit of uh, the geology of of britain and how that applies to my world um, so uh, if we imagine a line that runs from the uh, river x right up to the river tees um, uh, the geology to the southeast of that line is much younger than the geology to the northwest of that line. So uh, stones in this northwest part of Scotland can be up to many thousands of millions of years old. These are igneous, uh, uh, igneous volcanic based stones, whereas the uh, stones and the chalks uh, in the southeast are just a mere 66 million years old but I'm particularly interested in telling you about my life following this blue uh, this blue rash that runs up through the country now this is known as the limestone belt and these are uh, oolitic limestones of Jurassic age and I've been um, planning my furrow uh, working on historic buildings and monuments up and down this uh, this blue uh, blue area for, for many years now. Um, I generally just focus on uh, on uh, on the southwest. Um, so I'm based here in Froome and you can see where uh, the churches that we work on are based and the cathedrals. Um, we're a tiny company, there are only eight of us and just like to keep it that way. Um, I started at Salisbury Cathedral um, and we were working on the point of transition from the spire to the uh, to the tower. Um, I just chuck this in because this is the uh, internal scaffolding of the spire. And uh, at no point is this structure 
uh, touching the masonry. So it just runs all the way up and is freestanding. Um, ladders are pretty original, or they feel original when you go up. There's even an original windlass that still works and was last used in the 70s, I remember, uh, which lifts stone up um, from the crossing point. Um, so the first time I was working at the cathedral was at this point here, like I say, the transition from the octagon of the, of the spire to, um, to the square plan of the tower. And I became very interested in the engineering um, of this. How, you know, how on earth was it possible that a, a tra uh, octagon can be transferred down to a square plan? Well, the, the, pin the pinnacles here that you can see help to force the uh, stresses um, and uh, weight down through the tower. But it's uh, this device that's built into the corners of the, of the tower. So you imagine the squareness of the tower in plan. These just span the corners. And these are known as squinches, um, a purely Islamic invention um, built uh, to accommodate domes. So basically no uh, architecture of Islam, no dome architecture, um, no great spire of Salisbury. Um, here we were working to um, repair and replace the bullflowers that run up. Um, to replace uh, masonry sections and uh, undertake lime mortar repairs. So basically it's dentistry on a massive scale. Uh, the spire was erected about 100 years after the uh, foundation stone was uh, first laid. So the foundation stone was laid in 1220 and the spire was constructed around 1320. Uh, so I guess the bullflower is a late motif of the decorated period. Um, so when I left the cathedral, uh, my business partner and I, Andy, uh, we set up a, a little business and uh, we haven't stopped really. That was getting on 30 years ago. Um, this is a church just outside of Salisbury. It's not a church, it's a conservation trust um, church. Uh, it's, a, it's a live parish church and we were called in by the architect one day because um, uh, it had been struck by lightning. Now, I could remember the evening before and I couldn't recall any particular uh, storms that were blowing in. Anyway, we walked into the churchyard and it was like it had been hit by a bomb. You know, the spire had exploded and there was masonry all across the uh, graveyard. It was absolutely incredible. I've, you know, I've worked on a few structures that have been struck by lightning and this was very different. Um, so we tidied everything up, made it secure. We uh, won the tender to rebuild the spilot. Um, uh, out of Chicksgrove stone, which is a stone that we're using at the cathedral. Um, but of course, the Royal Artillery live firing range is uh, about half a mile away. And you can drive up the Avon Valley today and you will see the red flags flying. So um, I'm not sure it was an act of war more of an act of God for the purposes of the insurers. Didn't say that. Anyway, uh, we do a lot of bridge work. Um, this is a fairly typical pr project of ours. This is in Wiltshire in Bradford upon Avon. Um, and again, this bridge was built in 1320 uh, and it's purely Islamic in origin. Look at those arches, they're exactly the same uh, in design as the squinch in the tower that, we've, that I've just spoken about. So here we've used a hydraulic line mortar to repair the external surface of the stone um, uh, and keep the elements out. So we did this project about 20 years ago and um, I absolutely love it there. So, you know, I go back and walk the dog from time to time and it's still performing really well. Um, we had to take down these cut waters that face upstream um, that spread the flow of water through the arches. Um, they were absolutely full of seedlings um, and this one had a fully grown tree in it. Um, yeah, so we raked it all out um, and there are, there, you know, we grouted it, which is a form of filling the core of a structure with lime, uh, a lime slurry. Um, and it's been, it's been really good. There's been no tree growth there at all. 
it, you can see the pontoon that we work off here. Um, another view. Um, so the, the carriageway here uh, previously had tarmac on it, and that was holding moisture within the structure. So we rented this uh, bobcat auger uh, and mixed the mortar ourselves. This mixes a ton at a time. So you literally fill it, fill it up with uh, the ingredients. So that's stone dust, sand, and a naturally hydraulic lime, NHL5 in this instant. And by the time it came, uh, reached the other side of the bridge, um, it was ready to be spread. Uh, so that, you know, you can use this form of lime crete um, uh, for carriageway use to cover huge, huge areas without the need for expansion joints. Um, like I say, it's still performing really well now. So here's that um, um, arch I was talking about. Quite interesting that the centre point of the arch, you know, there's no sort of keystone, is quite offset. And you notice that with a lot of uh, historic buildings, that the masonry wasn't exactly pucker. Um, this bridge is really interesting because it's built with stone on clay. So it's line pointed on the outside. Uh, but the actual core of it is just a clay dug out from the riverbed when they diverted the river to um, to build the bridge. And you find that in the Kennet and Avon Canal, which is just uh, behind behind here as well. And also in the uh, Saxon Church in Bradford upon Avon, that has uh, a clay core to it as well. So we all like to talk about lime mortar, but I think clay is probably the most traditional building material in use in uh, certainly in southern southern Britain. Um, so no carpenters, no stonemasons, uh, you know, form work is needed to support masonry elements before we put them in. This is a new bridge on Thames. Um, and the problem that they have there is that these ribs, again, this is a, a stone vault of about 1320, keeps getting hit by um, drunken uh, host seasons canal uh, captains. Um, and they and they pop these off. So we've been out there a few times to fish, uh, fish the original uh, ribs out and uh, put them back into position. But you can only do that by uh, having a, a comprehensive formwork. Um, and I just uh, conservation is not just about working with the structure; it's about working with the natural world. And here on the the bridge at Bradford upon Avon, uh, you can see these. Um, these slots cut into this new block of stone. This is about it's about a yard across. It's absolutely gigantic, this stone, um, and about um, a foot deep. And we basically gouged out the interior and uh, cut these slots in the surface. And this is a maternity roost for Dor Benton's bats. Previously, they were just living in the cracks and the fissures of, of the archway, but obviously we, we had to secure that and uh, stop it back up. Um, when we went back a few months later with the uh, ecologist, he, he stuck his um, eyepiece in there. And it was absolutely incredible. It was just full of um, roosting, uh, roosting mothers and their offspring. Um, there's one on the other side as well, the other side of the vault. And that, um, that's where all the gentlemen go to smoke cigars and do things. Um, but just see how we've matched the dressing. So this is cut with an ax. Um, and use stone indents on the outside, and that matches very well uh, what was there before. The joy of this bridge was that it had never been uh, interfered with. It had always been um, a pedestrian bridge, pack horse bridge, and it's never had any vehicular traffic, so that saved it, um, really. Um, but one of, one of our career highlights was uh, working the Roman baths in Bath. So this is um, the famous Gorgon pediment, um, our business is called Minerva, so when we decided on a name, you know, the Roman architecture has always been an, of an interest, so it just felt appropriate that this would be a good, uh, a good start point for our business. So when the opportunity came up to rejig this uh, pediment and the one surviving column here, um, we, we just had to buy it, so we put in a very good price and uh, yeah, it worked very long, very hard to reset it. Um, the, the Roman Bars Museum found a couple of extra sections, uh, that one there and I think that one, 
which allowed the archaeologists to read this differently. So the actual angle of the pediment had been set uh, incorrectly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it was really great to take this all apart, conserve it, put it back together. Um, and also this section as well. The Georgians, when they were digging out the uh, pump room, they found all this beneath the, pu the pump room uh, for the Roman baths. And um, uh, they very thoughtfully quartered this colossal section of uh, column, fluted column, uh, and gouged out the inside. So like two of us could just carry this and pop it into position. The same with this uh, debased form of Corinthian capital. Uh, the carving on this is re it's, it's really interesting. The, the mind who created this concept, this that fused together the, the old Celtic deity, uh, there he is, old uh, Sulis with his beetling brow. Um, but they fused in with Minerva, which is also a female deity. Uh, and just to confuse, confuse things even more, he's a Gorgon. Um, I can't say she's a Gorgon. Uh, isn't she fantastic? She's got snakes. She's got snake hair and um, uh, flaming, flaming hair as well. Uh, but this little divot on on their nose, that's where the, that's the setting out point where the mason uh, in charge would have set his compasses out to uh, create this whole structure. Uh, so the, uh, the garland that goes around and the, the triangular pediment, everything comes off that point on on his nose. This would have been uh, decorated. So this little imperfection would have been um, taken care of back in the day. Um, but I love the continuity of, of what we do. Um, the tools are the same, the techniques are the same, the mindset is the same. Um, uh, these are Mason's tools um, from uh, Caerleon um, Museum in Wales, uh, very similar to what we use today in terms of axes and adzes. The chisels are a bit more brutal, but um, uh, the form of mallet is exactly the same as well. I mean, the mallet that I use is made of nylon um, and is exactly the same as that. Um, and these are from uh, ancient Egypt. So, you know, continuity in tools, continuity in mindset. I love that, that handing on of the baton. Um, something that, that I found really interesting in the Roman bars was the use of this device. This is called a, a Lewis pin, and it's a way of lifting a very heavy block. So you drill, a, uh, you, you drill a hole into the block, you pop your Lewis in, and they just, when a lifting force is applied, they just very slightly open up within the hole. Um, and that's unchanged from Roman times. So all of the big mage stones on the pediment that I've just spoken about have these Lewis holes in the back of them. Um, and indeed, I've used that actual Lewis set there um, on an earlier stone. I've just popped it in to see if it were, if it fits together. And uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, so just to show that continuity, so that, you know, the Romans were a couple of thousand years ago. Um, uh, this is a project that we concluded just before the lockdown, the first lockdown. Um, and this is a section of pinnacle that we're sending up. It's for the market cross in Castle Coombe. Um, very, very challenging project. So uh, there's an, let's just scroll through. You can just see here. So there's a late medieval market cross that runs up through this later 17th century structure. Um, and we had to replace the stone tiles um, and re, uh, re-carve this uh, pinnacle. Um, but the problem with it was that the frame was absolutely rotten. It was rotten as a pair. And Andy Jones, my roofer friend, who actually did the stone slating, he, uh, he said it was like an elephant balancing on its tr trunk. It was so unstable. And uh, the, the, the problem with the structure is that the piers were underfound as well. So all the masonry in these corners were loose or just sort of floating on mud. Um, so it's an absolutely frightful process to uh, draw 
the framework back together to uh, to get it actually working as a structure again but we work closely with english heritage and the building surveyor to come up with a um as light a, a solution as as we could uh, so these are stone slates uh, from the cotswolds and gold gold hill quarry um very very nice um we placed we replaced three quarters um three of the four sides and the north this north side here um is is the stones that we managed to salvage everything else went in the skip or is in my garden for uh garden decorative purposes <laughs> there you go what a job that frame was uh, none of us could figure out how they actually got it up um and managed to uh bolt it all together there we go so we are in the land of the church's conservation trust now um, so this is a sign that was up at uh, Old Dilton Church, which is a, a church that we've worked on for a, um, for a number of years. It's one of my favourites. It was um, it was a there's a deserted medieval village site just across the, the lane from the church. The church has survived, um, but when they there's a railway track just behind it, and when they moved, uh, when when the railway track came along, they put a halt, Dilton Dilton Marsh halt, just down couple of miles away and um, uh, a new community grew up around that point. So, you know, this was a really thriving, bustling place once, but all the mills have gone, the settlement has gone and all that's left are the church and those at rest. Um, it's quite, it used to be a, um, a hobo who lived in the porch. Um, he would cook uh, hedgehogs he'd wrap hedgehogs in clay and um yeah cook them and then he would just go out and help with the local farmers on the downs he was quite a well-known character in uh, in those parts he'd start off the day with a can of scrumpy jack anyway so with old dilton it's not you know it's it's joy is that it's absolutely sort of run of the mill um our work included plastering the uh, the interior. Here's Hannah um, fixing that up. Um, and here's the interior. And the joy of Old Dilton is not the fact that, that it's full of interesting stonework. It's its timber. It's its woodwork. Look, there's not even a chancel. There's not a stone chancel arch there. Um, triple decker pulpit. And you look at all these uh, smaller box, box pews here. Uh, all for individual families, uh, each had their own key. They're very economically minded. Uh, we've got some old uh, medieval pews here. But the problem that we had is that um, there was brown rot underneath all the pews. So we had to lift all the floorboards, dig everything out to, uh, to a couple of feet, um, uh, just to allow the... Uh, underside of the pews to breathe because there was a lot of um, deflections starting to take place within the actual timber itself so even though i'm a you know stonemason conservator we you know we we care for the general well-being of uh, all aspects um of of old buildings um but in in digging out underneath the the pews it was absolutely fascinating the stuff we were finding um we you know there was a good couple of tons came out and we were sieving everything that, that uh but before it got uh taken away and pins pins and pins and pins just it's, it's absolutely fascinating to understand how people used to dress and pins were vital in you know keeping roughs together and uh uh other other parts of people's attire um stubs of candles little clay holders for candles buttons um we found three half groats which uh, <laughs> uh all that sort of stuff not, not treasure but fascinating uh a, you know a, a fascinating view into how life was in the 17th 18th centuries um and that all went back in we just sprinkled it around we didn't put it in as a um as a sort of package just sort of sprinkled it around for the next generation to find um this is at lee delamere st 
at Margaret of Antioch, I believe. And this, um, this is a fragment of a rood screen. And now a rood comes from the Anglo-Saxon for cross. And uh, this is part of a much bigger structure that um, cut uh, across the chancel arch. Um, but it had been buried probably after the, or during the Civil War, uh, been buried under one of the box pews in the church and was recovered not that long ago. So um, very nice, fine conservation job. I mean, it was really grimy, but you can just get a little suggestion as to the uh, amount of color that there is to be seen. Um, so once it was recorded and uh, carefully cleaned, uh, there it is. Wonderful, bit of lapis lazuli used in there, I was told. Uh, so we made a new lead box and it's firmly fixed into the wall. Um, really wonderful. Um, so this is a Church Conservation Trust project, uh, Luffingcott. Uh, St. James is in Luffingcott, which is uh, uh, overlooks a wooded valley uh, um, where the River Tamar um, runs through um, and where Devon ends and Cornwall begins. Um, but the, there was um, a TV series called Restoration and they came and did some filming there. So, you know, they sent a helicopter and a camera crew down to check out what we were doing. So um, this was uh, 2001, 2002, we undertook the work. Um, it was very nice working away from home. Did a lot of exploring the local uh, local hinterland. Learned to surf there on that job. Anyway, there you are. That's, uh, that's my old hound, our old hound, uh, Spike. He could climb a scaffold ladder. Um, so he was, um, he was, uh, uh, a regular visitor up to the top of the tower. Long gone now. Uh, like I say, that's 20, nearly 20 years ago. Um, but again, water penetration, uh, differing ground levels outside. So the ground level was higher than inside. Um, very, a very poorly structure. The walls were full of cavities and voids. Uh, and all of the plaster was just uh, failing spectacularly. So we replastered all that. We, we grouted again, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we pressure grouted with a lime, lime grout to fill the voids in the walls uh, and then plastered over and uh, gave a good, uh, good coat of four or five coats of lime wash. So really, really nice. Uh, that, that barrel uh, wagon roof is fairly typical of Devon. Lovely. Um, but the principal part of the project was replacing the render that had been applied by a trowel only a few years before that had completely failed. So the actual wall infill of the, of the tower is um, uh, slates. Um, so you imagine roofing slates. The, uh, I mean, it should provide quite a good key, but there was no key at all. So it was, it was completely voided and failed. Um, so we were just meant to patch it up, but we said, look, this is daft. We said to John Bucknell, the, the architect, this is daft, and he agreed, and the CCT agreed. So we um, tried a new approach, which is to apply a rough cast. So that's throwing with a trowel, as you saw in the, the video uh, earlier. Uh, we made good all the granite uh, components. So it's a bit of an interesting transition for us working from the softer stones of Somerset to uh, diamond hard granite, I have to say. Um, but there, yeah, very, very fine job. But um, so that's the big reveal. This is how it is now. So this is 20, as I say, 20 years on. And it's it doesn't look great, does it? It could do with a coat of lime wash. But that said, nature is taking over. You know, the lichens are having a field day and that's the, you know, lichens are the start of the food chain. So to my eye, uh, in that wild place, it's probably the only wild place left in that part of Devon. Um, it's pretty wonderful. So uh, don't knock my handiwork on that job. Uh, it's just nature doing what nature does. And, you know, it's a very exposed site and takes a real buffeting from Atlantic storms. Yeah, very good. Um, 
so here we are uh, back at Hemmington Church that Peter was talking about earlier. Um, this is after we'd concluded the work to the tower. Um, working at Hemington has been the, oh my goodness, it's been the privilege of our lives to, to work there. So fantastic. Um, I shall talk you through it. So here, here we are at the height of summer. Um, the scaffolding is in place for works to the tower. Um, and that was masonry conservation and some replacement work as well. Um, so as I was saying earlier about the lichen growth, I mean, we scraped the moss off the, the, the weatherings just because it's, you know, that's a maintenance aspect. But uh, these works have to be undertaken um, before the bat breeding season. So here we uh, put some boxes up. Uh, working with the ecologist to uh, manage any remaining bat population before we uh, strip the roof. But I'll come to that in a minute. Um, I keep mentioning the lichens, but the lichens here are, are absolutely fantastic. Each face, each of the four faces of the tower had a different uh, lichen colonizing population, um, which is very satisfying, you know, considering they've been growing there since, uh, since the latter part of the 15th century um wonderful so um working working with natural things is really important as a as a conservator um so here's some of the stonework that's going up i'll show you where this is headed for um we had an electric hoist to get all the stonework up to the, to the top of the tower uh this is the uh west window of the tower so this is after the works and you can see how we filled the joints with a color matched lime mortar um, and these beautifully swishy uh, noses on the on the windows um, are lime mortar repairs so the actual stonework itself was in really good condition so there was absolutely no argument to undertake any replacement work to this fine window of late 14th century um, so we used uh, lime mortar to repair that the lime mortar absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so it's um, it's carbon negative you could say so it's really good uh, good way of working and right for the for the building lime mortars have been used for thousands of years so um, you know they've got a really good track record we don't use any modern materials at all apart from stainless steel to fix stones and um, uh, resin, uh, polyester resin to fix the stainless steel. So if you're doing retro fixing, you need to um, introduce a little bit of modernity, but, but basically everything else we do is uh, very old school. And when I say old school, I mean old school of about 13, 20. Um, here's a new uh, Malian uh indent going in uh this is going in in two sections so we cut back the face this is this is really frassy the surface of the stone so it didn't really have a, a future so this is a new piece of daunting stone uh ready to go and you can see these little dots um that's where the stainless steel fixings will go in to support it um and here we go so it, so this is a, a workstation up on the platform uh, last summer, um, the this is one of the uh, battlement parts for the top of the tower, and here's a here's a indented stone ready to, ready, ready to go. Um, so the architect was wanted us to just not replace the whole stone, but just replace this section. So like I say, it's dentistry, but on a far larger scale. Um, so the hunky punks and the gargoyle, the gargoyles are very nice here. Um, oh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about them in a minute. Here's Sam just fixing that section that she's just cut. So that's that section there is that section there. You can see our steel pins uh, holding all together. Good to go. So it just uh, needs some repairs. So here you can see how we're using a lime mortar uh, on uh, terracotta fixings uh, to create a repair. So we've got the new stone in, um, the actual 
uh, stone underneath it is in quite good order, but there's a surface. Uh, the stone has failed on the surface, so we just undertake a mortar repair there on a on a armature of uh, ceramic tea pieces that we make ourselves and fire in a kiln. Um, so there we go, all finished. Um, notice this piece of lead that goes on the top and the Somerset tracery here. So this is where the, the bell chamber is. Uh, and this is to let the sound of the, the bells out. So wonderful. Uh, this is a, a typical hunky punk at Hemmington. Um, they're called hunky punks in the Somerset dialect because they rest on their hunkers. Um, uh, but what a what a wonderful character. And they're both wearing a crown. Isn't that wonderful? Anyway, um, they did need some work. So we took, uh, took out all the unsightly cement mortar that they'd been, um, uh, that they were covered in. Uh, and then we gave them a nice, uh, we gave the crown a nice lead capping. Um, we were down to replace quite a few sections of, um, of this drip section here. And generally with, with drip sections, because it's a weathering and it's vital to the ongoing sustainability they're building, then, then those sections are, are replaced. Um, but I felt, I personally felt that it, that was a little bit intrusive and why not um, put a lead capping all along the top? Um, you see these lead dots, so they're fixed on onto the top of them, uh, onto the drip stones with these patches. Um, and it does it really nice, I have to say. So uh, uh, Emma Green, the architect, and Mary O'Dowd, the Church Conservation Trust uh, officer, all, all agreed that was a, a good and sensible approach and cost effective as well. Here's another one, the Boxer. They all get given names. Um, I like the way Andy Jones, our roofer lead worker, has just dressed that in around this character's uh, ear. So onto the roof. Um, I'll just give you a warning. There are um, uh, there, <laughs> I don't quite know how to put it. You're going to see a penis in a minute, <laughs> right? Um, but I watched Dr. Emma Wells's lecture the other week, and uh, so I know that anything goes at the Church's Conservation Trust lecture. So uh, here's here's the uh, lead roof going up. This uh, that's the lead roof covering the nave, and that roof has been there since 1756. Look at that, There's, there are uh, the original work people's uh, initials cut into that beautiful plaque. Um, but on the roof, there are tons and tons of uh, footprints as well. Um, people would go up there, they'd go with their pen knives and they would cut, um, uh, cut around their shoes. Um, there's also uh, Dawson's steeple jacks here of Clutton uh, when they did some repairs at the turn of the century. And of course, you know, Dawson's are still going. Brilliant. Um, but it's not all footprints and uh, friendly builders. Um, there we go. There's, there's, there's no way of putting it, is there really? JM. Um, I won't dwell on that, but um, all of the old footprints we um, fixed to this new position on the upstand of the tower. And uh, Andy Jones felt very strongly that the footprint, the, um, the non-footprint should be on the uh, north face right at the bottom of this uh, upstand here. He felt it wasn't appropriate. So, um, but he created this little, uh, this little scheme here. And notice the um, flowers for 2020. Clever man that he is. There you go. Just copying the um, Tudor roses here. So there you go. More footprints and more dubious imagery. Uh, this is on the, the hips of the tower roof. Um, 
seen that people visited from far around. There are lovely copper plate inscriptions of people's addresses all over it. Um, so uh, quite a few of the uh, lead panels have been saved and they are now in the ringing chamber of the tower um, under lock and key. Um, I just say if there's anyone who's not quite right out there, don't even try think about trying to get onto that roof because it is so well alarmed. As I as I know by the number of times my phone has gone off at two in the morning when there's a, a, a something flapping around. So that's Andy's new roof. Um, he had to put up with a lot of um, structural issues on the wall plate here. Um, great. Anyway, that's Andy and Archie. He is a genius. Um, getting towards the end, don't know what the time is. Um, here is my colleague Nell. Uh, she undertakes all the, all the most beautiful repairs that we do. Uh, and she's also gilded the weather vane here. So this is Halley's Comet, um, which appeared in 1769. So three years after the, the roof went on. Um, and there we are popping it uh, into position. Wonderful. So there's new uh, slates on the roof of the tower. You can see the hip that's got all the footprints on. So we've managed to save all that and uh, reuse it, which is so satisfying. Um, but all the new lead work around the tower is, is new. But like I say, that that is the lead work that's been saved. So it's been a nice long project there. We're just finishing up now. We're just in our last couple of weeks. Uh, it's fantastic Norman arch. Um, what's so great about working on these sort of churches is that when you start to peel away the layers, as we've seen with the footprints and other things, my goodness me, the things, the things we find. So this is a, a, a piscina. Um, you can just see the drain there that goes out into the churchyard where the holy water would have been poured um, after its use and Peter uh, my friend and colleague thought it'd be a good idea to have a poke around in that little hole well what did he find <laughs> lots of things uh, lots and lots of uh, um, glass glass shirts when the windows were put in maybe during the um, maybe the, during the Reformation or um, or after the Civil War. Um, just so much glass just rammed down there to keep out or to keep at bay certain bad spirits, perhaps. Um, and this is just a tiny selection of what he pulled out. Again, I say pins, screws, uh, uh, tokens for exchange, um, all, all sorts of odd stuff. And most interestingly, someone's come along fairly recently and um, put a very modern prayer token in here. Um, very interesting. Um, so we've uh, done lots of plaster conservation and uh, we've redecorated the interior. There's Annelle again, she's repairing the um, Blue Lies flagstones that were previously covered with a, a rubber backed rug which was killing them so you know void, moisture couldn't come up through the through the stones themselves um uh yeah and was leading to their delamination and decay but we've we've caught that now and um yeah it's good to go but you know i like the angels there i like the space the proportions are fantastic it all works so these two, uh, these two angel corbels are very interesting, aren't they? But if you look above them, you see the wood panelling there and those two U-shaped sections. Well, you're not going to believe there are beehives here. This is about 25 feet up. And on the other side of the wall, there's a tiny little hole to let the bees in. So, you know, bees and the church have a long, uh, a long association um, the, the bees haven't been in here for quite a while, it's fair to say, but the frames for the uh, collection of the honeycomb are still in there, waiting for the day. 
maybe maybe the CCT should colonise. I don't know. Pay pay a bee, beekeeper to come in. Anyway, and as we were preparing the surface, ready to take the lime wash and the distemper, we would uncover all these tiny fragments. So it, I'm sure there's someone in the audience today that could tell us what that says or what it's likely to say. Be good to know. Um, so we consolidated it and um, uh, just decorated around it. So there you go. Buy my book. Thank you. Oh, that's uh, that's Spike, uh, who's on the cover that I carved myself. So that's a bit of uh, Dalting limestone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was brilliant. And there's been loads of comments coming in. And everyone who's watching, thank you so much for the questions because they're fantastic. Um, so we're shortly about to go into question time. So now is your chance um, to ask Andrew some questions. Um, but as I said, before we go into question time, um, if you're enjoying this lecture in our series, please do consider supporting us. You've seen four examples of churches in our care, and you've seen the wonderful craftsmanship that goes into conserving um, these historic churches. So you can text CCT. So if you just have your mobile phone, um, in the text code, just text work the letters CCT to 70331, and that will give us a gift of three pounds. But we can comment some other text codes if you'd like to text a large amount. Um, you can donate through our website, or you can become a member from just three pound fifty per month. Um, and if you do that by direct debit and use the offer code lecture, and that's lecture in capitals, we will send you not one, not two, but three free <laughs> guidebooks um, from. Um, some wonderful, wonderful historic churches in our care. Now, Andrew, I'm going to dive straight in to some questions um, that have been coming in. And I said that they're, they're absolutely wonderful. So one of the questions that's recently just that shortly came up was um, how long on average does it take you? Uh, does it take for a job to complete? You know, what's the shortest amount of time it's taking you compared to the longest on a job? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, at, at Hemmingson Church, we started in J July, stroke August, and we're finishing this week. Um, but that is, um, you know, that's, as, as I've explained, that's a roof off, uh, con conserve the tower, carpentry, decorate the interior, just, you know, they're, they're even thinking about um, replacing the boiler. So there's all sorts. So that's, you know, several, several months. Um, I've, we were looking at a job in Bristol recently that was going to be a two-year project and that was just you know I, I had a chat with our team and it was just too long two years in commuting to Bristol on the same job so what's so nice about what we do is that you know we are journey men and women and we go from job to job um, in a you know in a very much a traditional way and uh, that's what keeps that's what keeps us all interested really and and motivated the fact that you know a job can be a week, could be a month, it could be six months. So, um, what, what yeah. was it that first got you into this line of work, Andrew? Um, well, I'm a frustrated archaeologist, so I I was rubbish at school. Um, but when um, when I was about 12, 13, a local um, open air museum, the Wealdon Downland Museum, started to take down a, a a late medieval structure in my town and I got involved in that and I thought you know what this is what I want to do you know so I was just bunking off school working with these uh, strange characters taking this old old building down no helmet in the monkey boots you know uh, did you have any formal training before you started your company or was it sort of you've learned um you know through apprenticeships or you know really on the job yeah I learned everything I needed to know in my time at the Wilden Downer Museum I was working as a volunteer um uh, I learned about lime, I learned about slaking lime, the importance of taking your time and uh, the importance of studying what you're going to be working on, sketching. Um, and then I went to Weymouth College um, to do a masonry conservation uh, uh, postgraduate and then um, uh, and then I was taken on as a trainee at Salisbury Cathedral. So yeah, I haven't looked back. But uh, I'm a uh, Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings Fellow, and that that wonderful organisation gave me more than uh, gave me more than anything really. gave me yeah gave me the opportunity to to move on from um, 
from from where I was. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. And so moving on so from your personal involvement, how you got into the trade, um, we've had some technical questions come in here, and I think it's quite interesting. So someone's asked a question that if keystones are off centre, does that mean an arch is less strong? <laughs> uh, technically, yes. But uh, the number of off centre arches that I've seen that are still doing their job after several hundred years would say no. Um, so yeah on on paper in on, um yeah on the computer yeah but but no <laughs> um so um, a question that's come in also is that um when you've been doing some of your conservation work have you ever found evidence of original mason carpenter or builders um work um so like any marks or graffiti so you've shown some of the sort of visitors but have you found any um evidence of you know the people who built it sort of marks on your on work um yeah i mean makes every piece of stone that you work with in a historic context will have a mark of the the maker the maker on a piece of ashless stonework so that's a piece of stone that's been squared um will have been paid um um paid by the components so they would leave their mark on there to ensure they that you know their work was all tallied up accurately at the end of the day um but you can tell different you know different masons have different approaches some some masons in one area will prefer to use a mallet and a chisel some will prefer will prefer to use an axe to cut the stone some will prefer to use an adz um yeah so you can you, know, you can read a bit into their into people's character i have to say and um, someone's asked a question that I think, so again, it's a really, we've had some really great questions coming in today, but um, during your um, time, um, you know, working on these historic places, um, have you ever come across an instance where um, you've been given a job where it's been, you know, despite all your experience, actually you've really struggled to find a solution um, using traditional um, methods or, um, you know, or that you've just not been able to uh, find a solution for? No, no, we always find a solution. <laughs> uh, you know the, the market cross that was really difficult because it was a question of pr prioritizing where the uh, you know where the problems were and the problems were so significant with this structure they could have just all collapsed uh, at any point so um you know do you do you secure the framework first or do you focus on the uh on the the corner piers which uh not not resting on anything um uh, yeah so it's just going with your wit and instinct really but i don't think you can be taught that i think you just have to pick it up along the way yeah and um are there any superstitions involved in your line of work no no no, yeah. no we used to put a thermos flask um with with a, uh, some notes in jobs that we did i shouldn't really say that yeah <laughs> so that that was always something we did but no nothing um, so uh, everyone's probably just been seeing my dog getting off the sofa, but um, someone's asked about um, the picture you shared of um, Spike up on the yeah. um, getting up the ladder. How did he get down from the tower? Oh, I had to carry him. He was rubbish that way. Yeah, <laughs> he did. Um, a, a bitch on heat went past once, and he was gone. And I, I, I um, uh, he managed to get down the, the scaffold ladder. Um, three, the three stages of scaffold ladder, and he did it on. You know. Uh, it did make it that one time, but it did cost cost some money at the vets afterwards. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we've got time for maybe a couple more questions. So everyone keep them coming. If we don't have time to answer them, I'll do my best to get um, answers to you in the coming week. Um, but Andrew, um, where are your main quarries that you work with for stone now? Um, so we generally use the Dalton Quarry. Um, uh, uh, Hemington Church, that's Dalton Quarry, which is just outside of Froome, between Froome and uh, Shepton Mallet. You know, there's been a, a quarry there since uh, Roman times. It's just, you know, it's a big hole in the ground. Great, great people who work there. And, it, you know, it's, um, uh, it's nice. It's a nice place to go, I have to say. Um, Ham Hill Quarry and, you know, there, there are quite a few quarries around Bath um, that we use. So, you know, every job is different. Every The geology of every church or structure that we work on, you have to, you know, get your um, jewel 
Buller's lens out and have a look at the nature of the shells to determine exactly what the um, what the stones are. Because he, you know, the term bath stone is a generic term across the board, and each quarry has different um, has a different flavour, if you like. So you, it's quite important to get that right. But of course, some of the quarries don't exist anymore, so you have to apply the best. And um, if someone was thinking about um, becoming a stonemason, how long typically does it take to train and master the art? Uh, you, you could have a good crack at things after three years. Um, you know, Weymouth College is very good. The college in Bath is is, is excellent. Um, the college, uh, the, uh, the building college in London, great. You know, there are a few places, but it is, yeah, it is getting more difficult, I have to say. The throughput is falling. And um, I think a nice question to finish on, and you may have touched on it earlier, but um, what's your favorite um, conservation job that you've ever done? Uh, in working, working nights in the Roman baths, it was pretty good. And we did a little bit of work in the West Kennet Long Barrow, which uh, is um, chapter one of my book. Um, and, uh, you know that, that that wasn't anything major that was just uh making good but my goodness me that you know that's the oldest structure in in southern britain you know it's three and a half thousand bc and uh, it still needs our services to you know keep it going so that was quite sobering but small churches the church in the middle of the field you got me Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for your time today. And everyone, thank you for your questions. As I said, I'll do my best to get some answers to you in the coming week. Now, um, as I said, if you enjoyed these lectures, um, do check out what's coming up. I'm going to, in the next, um, hopefully in the next couple of days, be putting on um, details of further lectures. Um, you'll be pleased to know that we're now pretty much fully booked up until July. Um, so I'm just firming up some details. I've got to do some artwork and I'll get those onto Facebook for you to have a look at. But do also look on our website for details of upcoming lectures. Now, next week, we're going to be joined by Professor Andrew Spicer. Now, Professor Spicer is going to be talking to us all about consecration crosses. So if any of you have been to some of our churches, you'll see inside of some of them, you'll find painted crosses. And they're called consecration crosses. We're going to be learning about what they are, what they served, um, and why so few of them remain. Um, so join us next Thursday at 1 p.m. for um, our next lunchtime lecture. But thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you again to Andrew. Um, if you've got any ideas for future lectures you want us to do, comment away. Um, but please everyone do keep commenting and um, sharing these lectures. But thank you so much and take care everybody.